in a discussion with flat earthers, sooner or later you can expect the question, how does water cling to a spinning ball and all variations from asking it straight up to asking it in an almost incomprehensible way? This question implies three matters of concern for a flat earther. Is the earth a ball? Is the earth spinning? And how come water sticks to the ball? This video only deals with the last aspect. How come water sticks to the ball? Most people answer to this question with Gravity! Giving that answer, you can foresee what's coming next. Gravity is a hoax. It doesn't exist. It has never been proven. And then your answer is, but Cavendish has proven it. And then the rebuttal, like one of those flat earth geniuses put it. And apparently this experiment has never been replicated. So gravity, which is a theory, and was only invented because they said that the earth spins and it's needed to explain why things don't go flying off the spinning earth. And as far as I know, this is the only so-called experiment, like this chap's explaining, that gravity, according to them, is all objects of mass are pulling towards each other. And so this experiment is supposed to demonstrate that. There's another set of lead balls inside there. Uh, this experiment really is very difficult to get to work and a, a technician has sawed it apart so, because he got so frustrated. Yeah. I don't think I need to say much else, do I? The technician got frustrated so he sawed it apart because it doesn't work. <laughs> Let's start with gravity has never been proven. I could react with Jump of a building and when you arrive at ground level, tell me again that gravity doesn't exist. But that would be as narrow-minded as asking the question in the first place. Gravity can be proven by proving that two masses attract each other and that that attraction cannot be attributed to other influences like magnetism, electrostatic forces, air movement or such. Well, that was exactly what Cavendish did and what any amateur can do as can be seen in these two videos. Here is a second trial where I re-allowed the device to move freely for a longer period of time. By doing this, he found that the rod would bounce off the large rocks and come back and eventually stay connected to the rocks and not bounce back. Due to time purposes, this clip was sped up by 800%. Of course, those are a little bit crude and don't cancel out some external influences. In the following demonstration, Professor Zacharias of MIT shows the effect of two masses on each other with two boxes filled with sand and two bottles filled with water, eliminating the magnetic influence. Within a closed box, eliminating the influence of air currents, that is constructed like a Faraday's cage, eliminating electrostatic and electric influence. We're going to repeat an experiment performed by Cavendish more than a hundred years ago. We're going to try to measure the force of gravity between a box of sand and a bottle of water. Our two bottles of water are suspended 
from a yardstick that you can see. The yardstick, in turn, is suspended by means of some recording tape, thin recording tape, that goes clear to the ceiling. In order to show the angle of twist of the pendulum, we have a mirror attached to it right down here. A light spot is reflected from it, shows its swing on the wall. The period of the pendulum is really 12 minutes, but you see it here in 12 seconds, as the minute hand of that clock shows. And I'll mark the middle of the swing like that. Now we're ready to uh, put the boxes of sand in place so that they can pull on the uh, bottles. OK, now we're ready to watch the sand pull on the bottles. It's swinging. And the center of swings is displaced over to one side. And I'll mark a new center of swings. Now, instead of setting the boxes back the way they were originally, uh, what I'll do is to move them around so that they deflect the pendulum in the opposite direction. This will give me twice as big an effect. There it goes. Now it swings over to the other side. And there you've seen the effect of the force of gravity acting between relatively small bodies. Notice, too, that the glass and the screen wire had no effect, but the screen wire is there for a reason. Watch this experiment. I can charge this lucite rod up here by rubbing it on my sleeve and uh, pick up a piece of paper very easily. Let's see if that charge, which you proved to be there, see whether that has any effect. None at all. Screen wire shields it out. But let's see what happens now if I very gently, very gently lower the case and hold up this charged rod. Practically jumps out of the case. Look at that. The electric force is tremendous compared with the gravitational force. Now let me first explain a little bit more about the gravitational constant. It was Newton who came up with the equation for gravity. The big G in this equation is the uh, gravitational constant. There's a lot of misunderstanding about this, because the way we use G in everyday language. Big G is the gravitational constant. Small g is the acceleration as a result of Earth's gravitational force. And 1g, 2g, 3g indicate the acceleration that is felt, for instance, by a Formula One racing driver when taking a corner. But that most people associate with the force the, drive, the driver feels. People, and especially flat earthers, make a lot of mistakes with g. Some say G is gravity. Some say G is the gravitational force. Others mix up small g and big G and claim that, because small g changes dependent on where you are on the Earth at a greater or smaller distance to the center of the Earth, the gravitational constant, big G, isn't constant. So Newton was wrong. This is an overview of some experiments done and the gravitational constant derived thereof. Most of these experiments use some kind of torsion balance, 
like the one Cavendish used, but in much more sophisticated form. And there are others, like Professor Veining Minus, who used the twin pendulum to find the gravitational acceleration on different depths of the ocean. And there are Schwartz and Faller, that uses the gravity field of a half ton mass to perturb the trajectory of a free falling mass. The accuracy of these measurements is astounding. So we can say with confidence that the existence of a force exerted by two masses on each other has been proven by Cavendish and that this experiment has been repeated numerous times. And now Brian Mullen, him again, says Well, when I started researching this, I said, okay, well, let's, let's see some examples of a modern day torsion rod experiment that somebody's built that shows how this works. Well, I couldn't really find one. I uh, actually had a lot of trouble finding one. Actually, one of the physics professors that was praising him had a little model that he held up and was, and was joking that his TA couldn't get it to work and got frustrated with it and gave up. Well, that's either a flat-out lie or Brian Mullen hasn't figured out how to do a proper Google search. But well, we are used to that with flat earthers, don't we? And besides, who trusts Google gun nowadays? It gets really interesting when he comes up with a rather bizarre theory about how Cavendish got to find the gravitational constant. But then you look at the density of iron and notice that actually the density of Earth is pretty close to the density of iron based on you know, everything that was calculated, the mass that came from this relationship up here. So I started thinking, you know, this is, this is pretty high. And that's exactly why we theorize that the Earth has an iron core. How do we know they didn't guess, or that Cavendish didn't guess this mass of Earth? And then just use it to solve for G? Seem far-fetched? I don't know. You know, we... The fact that we can't really get this experiment to work this torsion rod experiment to work is perplexing, very perplexing. So what he says is that we deduced from the mass and the density of the earth being quite high that its core must be of iron, something that was hypothesized only in 1940. So Cavendish could, wouldn't have known this and he didn't know the mass of the earth. That was what he was looking for after all. But still, Cavendish supposedly estimated, or should we say gambled, the density as being over 5000 kg per meter cubed, a density more than twice the density of solid rock, which would be a better guess for him at the time, and reverse engineered the gravitational constant that way. You really can take your conspiracy theories a bit too far. Besides, Cavendish didn't determine the gravitational constant in the first place. He was measuring the density of the Earth in relation to the density of water. The determination was derived much later, be it on the basis of his results. And it was within a 1% margin to the most recent me measures of Big G. What intrigues me is the explanation flat earthers give for why we stand firmly with our feet on the ground and not float around or freely moving in random directions. That is because of density and buoyancy, most of them say. So they use Archimedes law that says that you, if suspended in liquid or a gas, experience an upward force equal to the weight of the fluid or gas that you have displaced. So here we have Archimedes law involving force and weight. So because the weight of a person is greater than the weight of the volume of air he is displacing, he falls downwards. The force downwards is greater than the force upwards. What force downward? 
but according to flat earthers there is no gravity. Which force is acting on them then? And why is that force always pointing downwards? Well, they say, going downwards is an intrinsic property of mass. That's just another way of saying, I don't know, but it just is. But how come that an object, when it falls, accelerates downwards? For an object to accelerate, you need a force working upon that per object. Or is that an intrinsic property of mass also? So mass not only knows which way it is down, it also knows how high it is above the ground. Or is the acceleration of 9.81 meters per second per second also an intrinsic property of mass? But how does mass know that on the North Pole it should accelerate at 9.932 meters per second per second? and at the equator at 9.780 meter per second per second. And how does Mars know that it is on the North Pole? And then I'm not even taking into account that you need a general downward force Gravity. to prove the correctness of Archimedes' law. And you can't define weight without gravity. I would like to close with a fragment of the end of Brian Mullen's video. Another thing I found out based on my research is that Cavendish and Newton were both Freemasons. It's a very big club. For lack of arguments, he falls back to the most stupid, most inapplicable, weakest and therefore by flat earthers most used argument he can come up with. It's all made up by the Freemasons. Variations of this are It's the Illuminati. It's the Jews. It's the Nazis of NASA. It's the Atheists. It's the Catholic Church. It's those who don't read the proper King James translation. And so on and so further. In fact, Everybody is to blame. It would be funny if it wasn't so pathetic.